Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? This is a program we make no apologies for at all, is interested completely in the Bible. In fact, our earnest desire and prayer is that more and more people might recognize the truth that the Bible is the law book of God. It came from the mouth of God. It is God's law that is given to every one of us, the whole human race, and, uh, and uh, that we are, because it is God's law, we are to try to be obedient to it. And uh, we're hoping and praying and desiring that as many people as possible will begin to recognize this. Because as we try to be obedient to it, we, le we want to read it more and to learn more about it, about our sins and about the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, eventuality of having to stand before the judgment throne if we do not become saved and to learn more and more about God's salvation plan. But in the process also of of getting better acquainted with the Bible because I want to be obedient to it, I also discover that God commands me to seek salvation, to cry to God for mercy, uh, to beseech Him for His mercy because God will is a very merciful God. And He has a great a plan to save a great multitude, right, in our day. And that could include me, too, if I'm not already saved. Uh, we cannot come to God to dictate him, oh, to him, Oh, Lord, I'm a good person. I've done this and that and the other thing. And therefore, I know I'm going to become saved. No way. We have to leave it 100% in the hand of God. But as we are trying to be obedient and, and begging God for his mercy, at the same time, we have that gorgeous and wonderful <clears throat> hope that maybe I too might be one of those whom God has elected because he's not a respecter of persons and uh, uh, he, uh, he uh, I could just as well be one of God's elect as anyone else and the fact is today he is saving a great multitude and maybe I too will be included. Oh, my, if only more and more people would take that approach to the Bible. Well, you know, we have a letter here from, uh, from uh, uh, Nicaragua, Nicaragua. And uh, this person uh, has received a little written information from Family Radio. And uh, she comments, I did not like where uh, this literature talks about the fact that we shouldn't go to church anymore because I feel good listening to the spiritual leader inside the church I belong to because he it is a spiritual place also Jesus had a special place for worshiping that is why I believe that there was a purpose for having the churches as the house of God now our caller or our listener in Nicaragua is correct in the fact that the churches were established by Christ as a place of worship, a place where we could receive spiritual help. And it is true that uh, we have learned, if we've been in the church a long time, uh, that we can receive a lot of uh, comfort there, a lot of encouragement. But when we look at it very candidly, very honestly, we find that we are not getting the right material. We're not being taught the right things uh, that are necessary in order that we might hopefully become saved. Because, first of all, the very fact that the people in the church, the elders, the deacons, the pastor, or the friends, tell us when we become uncomfortable with something in our life, oh, don't worry, everything is all right, you were baptized, you made your confession of faith, you accepted the Lord Jesus. And so we do get some human encouragement. We feel very, very encouraged by all of that. But really, really, 
they are not helping us one iota, one bit, because we ha what we they should be doing is telling us what the Bible has to say about salvation, and that is not taught in the churches. What is taught in the churches is a man-made gospel where you have done this, you have done the other thing, therefore you can be assured that you're a child of God. And that's the last thing we should hear. That, for example, is the reason that God has ended the church age. One of the reasons, maybe there are others, but one of the big reasons he's ended the church age so that as the truth goes out into the world, namely that we can't do anything about our salvation. We have to wait upon God 100%. And those who have become saved or do become saved, they, their sins were paid for long before they were ever born. And Christ did all the work to make that provision an enormous amount of work as he had to endure the wrath of God, uh, the equivalent of eternal damnation to make that payment. And if we b still are going to that church, yes, there will be someone there who looks so holy, who looks like he's truly a servant of God, who really seems to know the Bible. And they, when we ask them questions about salvation, they will say, uh, or about a particular verse relating to salvation, they will say, my dear sister, my dear brother, let me tell you what that means. And immediately they'll begin to empty that verse out of its truth. They will twist it to satisfy with what their church believes. And, oh, it'll be comforting what he has to say. It's all positive, all positive. We like it. And so we go away feeling we have the truth and we have not the truth at all. And so in order not to have that complication, God has instructed us, come out of the churches, come out of the churches and listen only to the Bible. Only let, let it be the authority and not what some church creed has, give, has decided, what some confession or some, what some pastor teaches. In fact, don't trust me either. I trust only the Bible. I'll simply try to direct you into looking into the Bible, but their trust has to come just waiting upon God. Oh, God, have mercy. Maybe I, too, could become saved. Well, thank you, Nicaragua, for your question. And now, shall we go to our first caller on our telephone lines? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good evening. Good evening. Yes. Yes. Yes, I have a question regarding um, Second Timothy. Second, three. Second Timothy chapter three. Yes. All right, let's turn to that. Second Timothy chapter three in which verse? Specifically verse six, but you have to start at one and go through. I I'm sorry, which verse? Verses one through six. One but this no but, also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Is that the passage? Yes, that's it. But um, I'm going to focus on verse 6. Can you explain to me, are they talking about believers or non-believers in the church? Oh, well, it's talking about those who are not true believers. Oh, everybody in the church is a believer. They all believe that Christ is their Savior. But they, if we're going to define believers as those who have truly become saved, then we know it is talking about terrors or those who think they're saved. Look at it. It talks about in verse 5, having a form of godliness. In other words, outwardly they look very, very holy. But denying the power thereof from such turn away. And that is the power comes in the fact that there's nothing that I can do or have done to get myself saved. It's dependent entirely on the power and the authority of God. And that is just not taught in the churches. It is, 
in the churches it's taught that no you have to do certain things you have to uh, you have to uh, cry out to, you have to uh, uh, you have to uh, uh, accept Christ you have to get baptized or whatever and only if you do this and that and pray the sinner's prayer or some other prayer then you can know that you've become a child of God and that's denying the power of God so essentially it's talking about non-believers it's talking about non-believers who think absolutely believe they are true believers but they have been deluded they have they have only picked and chosen certain verses in the Bible to develop their doctrines and have not looked at the whole Bible. They really have no understanding of what God's salvation program is. So all of those words, descriptions about covetous, loving themselves, all of that stuff, it's talking about people in the church? No, it's not talking about just people in the church, as it's talking about uh, uh, covetous, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful. It's talking about the whole world. We see this, this, uh, uh, this uh, rebellion against God all through the world. The world is, is becoming more and more wicked, and, uh, but it's also in the church to some degree. And and we can see this if we look around. The only thing we can't see with our with our physical eye is that today God is saving a great multitude of people outside of the church. But we know it is true because the Bible says so. That's all a matter of of trusting in the Bible as the infallible Word of God. And having checked all through this very carefully, we find that indeed. It's God's program that today there is a great multitude that he is saving. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Mr. Camping. Hi, how are you? I'm going to turn my radio down right now. Yes, please do. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, so happy to finally be able to speak to you. Um, my first question is... Um, I was listening last night, and you said that God care, flutters about the earth because he's concerned for mankind, because he loves us, uh, his true believers, and that really touched me. And then you, you were talking about um, King David and how his son, you know, he had been on the throne for a long time, King David, and how his son you know, started to come after him and that um, David's sins were starting to catch up to him. Does that mean that we have karma that, you know, I, I'm catches sorry. up to I, us? I, I'm sorry, I'm missing what you're saying. I can't... Uh, uh, you speak a little more slowly. Uh, you, uh, uh, again, what passage in the Bible are you talking about? Okay, last night you said that Somebody called in, and they were talking about something, and you said that God flutters over the earth in concern for mankind because he cares about us. That's why he sent Christ. Stop right much. there. Stop right there. You said last, uh, I said that what that, about God? That God loves that God flutters about over, he, basically you said God flutters over the earth in concern for mankind because he cares about us and that's why he sent Christ. I'm, Is so, that, I'm sorry, I'm just not able to take this call. I'm really sorry, but uh, it's difficult for me to follow you and so I'm sorry, you'll have to try calling another time. Thank you for calling. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, thank you. Good evening, uh, Mr. Camping. Um, I have a question. Well, it, uh, my uh, grandson uh, asked me a question that I couldn't um, explain to him. He was wondering uh, how the uh, different races came about. Uh, it's the, uh, you know, how come we're all different? Like, uh, say, for instance, the Chinese, the black race, you know. Like, how did that, um, uh, you know, come up? 
What passage in the Bible are you talking about? Well, I can't really find it in the Bible. That's why I'm calling you. To see if you could uh, explain to me how, um, you know, the origin of the race has uh, begun. Um, and, and again, I, uh, you're, you're speaking about where do races come from? Is that your question? The fact uh, is that God uh, d only indicates in Genesis 11. He indicates in Genesis 11 that God confused the languages uh, at the time of the Tower of Babel, which was about 5,000 years ago, approximately. We don't know precisely. And, 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 the, ra and the peoples were driven apart. And the Bible does not tell us um, uh, why the, the uh, pigmentation in the skins of people changed so that we have a very dark-skinned people and very light-skinned people. But we do know that the races came because God confused the language. Suddenly, uh, uh, some of the people were speaking Chinese, and so they went off and ended up uh, eventually populating the area of the world called China. And some people began to speak in in Russian, and they began to go off in another direction. God confused the languages back about 5,000 years ago. That we do know. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, I have a question about um, where in the Bible it says that Jesus touched the blind man's eyes and it said, and he said, I see men as trees, and then he touched the man's eyes again, and it said, he said, I see the men. And then I'd also like to know where I can find, I think it's in Corinthians somewhere. Well, where you're talking about a, a miracle that Jesus, I think it's in the Gospel of Mark, but I'm sorry, I'm not able to put my finger right in it. I recall, however, that it possibly is in, it's in one of, it's either Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, but probably is in Mark, but I can't, I can't tell you exactly where it is. Uh, he, uh, he, uh, this, this individual uh, actually first began to see partially, and then he began to see, see fully. And you know, that's the way our, the way our, uh, our situation is when we become saved. At first, God opens our spiritual eyes because we've given a brand new resurrected soul. But my, we. Uh, uh, are just then uh, beginning to really learn what the law of God asks us to do. And we begin to try to be obedient. We learn something about salvation. But then as we go along, as we grow in grace, as we work in the Bible, we learn more and more about what the Bible teaches. But, I'd also like to know, I think it's in um, Corinthians somewhere where, where I think it's, I don't know, Paul who says, um, yeah, it was the grace, I worked harder than all of them, but not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Do you, are you familiar with that one? No. I worked, yes, I worked harder than all of them, but it was the grace of God that worked through me. Yeah, are you familiar I, with that phrase? I, yeah, I'm, I can't, I don't, I can't help you with that. I'm okay, sorry. that's Thank fine, you. that's fine. That's Thank fine. you for just calling and like, sharing. So nice. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, good yes, evening. Yes, uh, Harold Kempton, let me turn my radio off. Yeah, please do. How are you? Go ahead with your call, please. Okay, um, I have a question uh, uh, that your prior uh, prior, uh, prior caller asked about uh, having a form of godliness but not denying its power. I see that. I'm in the Brooklyn, New York. Let me shut my radio off, Harold Kempton. Yeah. Now, now, what was your question again? Yes, I just shut my radio off. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm from the Brooklyn, New York area, and I have there's a lot of uh, Hasidic Jews and Orthodox Jews. I notice they like to walk around in their costumes. They have a form of godliness, but they seem to deny its power. Can you uh, relate to that? Well, the fact is, we don't have to look at anybody. We just got to look in their own mirror. You know, we... Uh, 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 anyone who believes they are right with God, whether you're a Jew or a Buddhist or a Mohammedan or a, 
a Baptist or a Methodist or a, a Roman Catholic, it makes no difference. They believe that they are right with God as they understand God. And, and uh, uh, they uh, can be very self-assured. They can feel very secure in, their, in what they are believing because they have really been, uh, been trained by their denomination or their trust, their church or their religion to believe that what we teach you, that is the truth. But the fact is, all of that is worse. It's, it's worse than nothing because it gives those dear people the feeling that all is well. Uh, they are secure. And so they just go along right to the end of their life or the end of time. And suddenly they're going to find themselves facing the judgment throne. But we have to go to the Bible. We have to go to the Bible. And only as we look at how we stand or what we believe in the light of the Bible. And we're ready to be corrected by the Bible. And it alone is the authority. That's the only safe place to be. And thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, Harold Camping, I found that verse that a uh, girl is looking for. That's Mark 8.24 about Mark. the uh, men walking as trees. Yes, it was in the Gospel of Mark. And yeah, I got another uh, thing I want to uh, share with you, too. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a radical Christian, and uh, in Second Timothy 3... The Holy Spirit is describing conditions in the professing church in these last days, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Second Timothy 3, 7, according to these apostates, the church which began as the pillar and ground of the truth is in these last of the last days seeking the truth, thereby acknowledging they never have found it. <laughs> How do you like that? Well, it, it isn't. The, the church has never been the pillar and ground of truth. Yeah, that's course. what they say, though. Well, that's what they say. But the, the fact is God is the pillar and ground of truth. But, uh, you know, you can't say this is just talking about the churches. It's, it's, uh, it's everybody. They have their own uh, way of trying to get... To get uh, uh, right with God, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. It is true that it's very severe in the churches as uh, they are trying to uh, follow the church doctrines to get there, but actually it's a very broad statement in illustrating uh, what is very ha really happening in our day. And it's very sad. It's not anything that we can smile about because it is grievous that this is the case and we should be weeping. We should be weeping because there's not one of us that does not have loved ones in this kind of a situation. Our loved ones who believe that they're safe and secure in their church or even those who are outside of the churches but who, are, who could care less about the Bible because they believe they have found a philosophy to live by that that is uh, they can be very secure and very safe in but thank, thank you, you. Camping. thank you for calling and sharing and uh, shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum oh brother camping yes i was listening last night about jesus christ and god now i was puzzled about that myself so what happened was i asked god to help me with this so I went through scripture after scripture, but the only one that, that led me to was John chapter 14, verse 20. John 14, verse 20. Let's look at that. John 14, verse 20. There we read, um, at that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Uh, let, me, let me back up. We read in verse 16, or let me start with verse 15. If ye love me, keep my commandments. That's the nature of love, is to 
want to do the will of God. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Now, Christ was the comforter that was uh, had come as the Savior, and the other comforter is God the Holy Spirit, whom God planned to send in order to uh, work in the local congregations in order that they... Uh, that the gospel might be applied by the Holy Spirit to the lives of those that God planned to save, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. That is, uh, Christ, of course, identifies with the Holy Spirit also because in Christ is all the fullness of God, but he shall be in you. And in this context, it does not mean that he's, he's not speaking about uh, individual believers that finally the Lord Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit will be in you, although that could be included. But he's also speaking in your midst in, because it was God's plan that when the Holy Spirit was poured out, he would be operating in the local congregation to save those that he planned to save as the gospel was shared. And uh, then he said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you yet a little while. And the world seeth me no more. But as but ye see me because I live, ye shall live also. At that day, ye shall know that I am in my Father. Now, we've gotten to that verse. What day? When the Holy Spirit is poured out, and literally this happened in Acts 2, when about 3,000 were saved. Uh, they, they recognized, when we become saved, we recognize that Christ is indeed identified with the Father. He is in the Father, and ye in me and I in you, that there is an intimate relationship that exists between the true believer and the Godhead. That's why... We read in Matthew 28, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The name is not uh, a name like I have a name or you have a name. The name means into the very essence of whom God is. But thank you for calling and sharing. Now, right now, we're going to pause for this message. We're continuing with the open forum, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to open forum. Yes, Mr. Kemp, and you're talking to me? Go ahead. With your oh, call. okay. Uh, two issues. Um, I was reading the uh, issue of the local newspaper here in New York today. Um, it's an Associated Press article, and the Pope Benedict the Sixteenth says that the Orthodox churches were defective, and that other Christian denominations were not true churches, and that the Catholics are the only true Christians. That's the first issue. Well, the fact is, uh, many denominations take that position. There are other denominations, Protestant, uh, various Protestant, de- 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 Protestant denominations that think they are the only true church. Uh, every, every church, finally, the reason someone belongs to a Baptist church or a Reformed church or a Catholic church or a Buddhist church or a Mohammedan church is because they believe this is truth. That's why they are there, and so we shouldn't be surprised at that. But the fact is, there's the, the test of whether we are identified with the true gospel or not has nothing to do with the church. It has to do with how we look at the Bible. And if we don't look at the Bible as God's word and and uh, is the t- only authority, like like uh, if we make the church dogma, I don't care what church or religion it is, the authority, and it is not the Bible that's the ultimate authority, then we have a false church because we are we have made ourselves God. We have made ourselves as a denomination the source of truth. And that's just not possible. It is the Bible that has to be the ultimate and only authority. Good response. My second thing is uh, last week you mentioned something, and I said, wow, how could he make a statement like that? Um, You said that Christ had his bones broken for us, and 
then I looked it up, and it did say bones broken, but it wasn't referring to the crucifixion. Right. It was referring, um, figuratively speaking, to the Last Supper when we broke bread. Excuse the... me. I have never, never, unless I was sleepwalking or or in a coma or something, I have never said that Christ had his bones broken. Um, that is not well, possible. Well, I'm saying if you did say that, you would be right, because it does mention that in the Bible, but not for the crucifixion itself. Right. He because did, The Bible indicates he did not have a bone broken. Right. Yes, absolutely. That that is what it says. But when um, in in the verse in the Bible, I'm sorry, I don't have it right now. Maybe somebody can call it in. It does mention that that Christ says that this this bread or bone is broken broken for me. I'm, I'm not aware of that. I'm right. not aware of that. Okay, well, somebody will call up then. Uh, well, thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I'm looking at um, Exodus 4. Yes. Verse, verse 24. Exodus 4, verse tw 24. There we read... Uh, and it came to pass that by the way in the end that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah, that was the wife of Moses, it's talking about Moses, that the Lord, that Jehovah met him and sought, or, or excuse me, then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. Now what is your question? Um, I wasn't clear on why the Lord was trying to kill him. Well, this, this again, is a statement that can only be understood when we follow the biblical rule, namely that Christ spoke in parables. That is, he gave us earthly illustrations and historical events that in themselves don't look like they have anything to do with the gospel, and yet we have to search the Bible in order to find the spiritual meaning of these actions. Now, this particular action goes back to a sentence that we read in Genesis chapter 17. The Bible says in Genesis 17, verse 14, that the uncircumcised man-child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. In other words, if someone, uh, go, uh, and again we have to understand this spiritually, it is simply saying that if our sins have not been cut off, which was typified by physical circumcision, then we're still under the wrath of God. But looking at this very literally for a moment, here is Moses coming in, to Egypt at the command of God to lead the nation of Israel out of their enslavement to Egypt and, and bring them on their way to the promised land. And he had neglected to circumcise one of his two sons. And, and so therefore his son according to this strict the physical literal language of of uh, Genesis chapter 17 verse 14 the uncircumcised man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised that soul shall be cut off that is that soul is to die and so God should have killed his son because Moses had failed to circumcise his son. But God begins to uh, uh, put his, his uh, anger on Moses. He sought to kill him. Now, he didn't actually kill him, but he is using the language as if Moses had become killed. And here we have a dramatic picture of 
the salvation program. We are typified by those who are spiritually uncircumcised. We have not of ourselves had our sins cut off. We're under the wrath of God, and we therefore are on our way to hell. We are subject to the second death. But Moses typified at this point the Lord Jesus, who who he took our place like Moses was taking the place of his son. God was killing Moses just like God brought Jesus into eternal damnation to make the payment for our sins. And, and that is the picture that God is painting here. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. And you see, uh, Zipporah is now a picture of us believers, and we are the bride of Christ who is a bloody husband because he shed his blood in order to cut off our sins. But thank you for calling and sharing that question. And uh, now shall we take our next call, please. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. I was wondering if you've heard of the mummified remains of Hatshepsut being on display in Egypt. Uh, about the... The mummy. Oh, the mummy. Oh, yes, Hatshepsut's mummy. Yeah, you know... Uh, long ago, this was about 40 years ago, I wrote the book, Adam When? And at that time, I did a real intense study of Egypt. I, I had access to a very fine library of, of uh, archaeological books and so on, and I was able to look up a lot of things. And I found that Hatshepsut, and this, of course, is not written in any of the articles about that mummy they have found, but it uh, it fits right in uh, to a degree. I'll explain why I say it in to a degree. Uh, but had Shepsud was the princess uh, that that uh, had taken Moses out of the water. She probably was a young lady about 15 years of age, and then later on she became a, a pharaoh and a co-regent with with uh, Tuthmosis the third who was younger than she, but Tuthmosis III was one of the greatest uh, military pharaohs that ancient Egypt ever did have. He is often spoken of by the archaeologists as the Napoleon of Egypt because of he had 17 very successful crusades or campaigns of, of uh, military activity, whereas his, his uh, uh, Hatshepsut was a great builder. But then, uh, when Moses killed the killed the, um, uh, the the Egyptian, and and uh, when he was forty years of age, now he was reared as a son of the king, if you will. In other words, even though he was a uh, he was taken out of the river and was a Hebrew, nevertheless, uh, and and Hatshepsut knew that. Yet at the same time. Uh, 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 he was, uh, we know from the Bible, uh, was uh, given all the knowledge that was available in Egypt, and he was, he was uh, royal uh, in a royal family in a very, very royal place. It's conceivable if, if the th if things worked out just rightly, he might have even been a pharaoh for a period of time. But when he was 40 years old, he. Uh, he, uh, 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 as a son of the king, had a right to do this. He killed a, an Egyptian who was molesting a, a fellow Hebrew. And there it was proven, uh, uh, it was seen, and, and people began to know that his heart was with the Hebrews, with the, with the slaves that, uh, that now had grown to be a nation of, uh, of, of almost a couple million people. And, and so this news got back to the Pharaoh, who was Hatshepsut. She reigned as a king as well as even though she was a woman. Uh, the historical record shows that she called herself a king. And so Moses had to leave. He had to get out of there because Hatshepsut would have had him killed. 
Then, while he is in Midian, uh, some years had ships that died, and uh, and God told him that. And finally, it was yeah, he took God commanded him to go back to Egypt to lead the people out. And he went back to and the Pharaoh that he dealt with was Tuthmosis the third who had been reigning for a long time now. It had been some years since that had ships that had died. Now, I read the article that has been in the newspapers about all of this, and they have given the dates of the approximate birth of Hatshepsut and the approximate date of her death, and they're off about 20 years. It, uh, with the Bible is the true historical account. And they, if you would investigate that more carefully, you would find that in the archaeological record there was five different possibilities uh, for the uh, the uh, uh, timing of these events. And these, any, any one of these five uh, possibilities would fit. They were all within a range of about 20 or 30 years. And one of those five dates fits right perfectly to the biblical record where it shows that uh, that a, that Moses fled Israel in 1487 BC and and uh, that he was born in the year uh, 5 1527 BC and at that time Hatshepsut would have been about 12 to 15 years of age so now they have discovered her mummy and they believe that they have plenty of information to that they know it is Hapshet's Hapshet's mummy. Now, the very interesting part of this now is that when Tuthmosis became king, he expunged the record as far as he could of the reign of Hatshepsut, and they complain about that or indicate that in these articles. And they wonder why did they do? Why did he do that? And uh, and they speculate they may have done it for this reason or that reason. And we don't know either for sure why uh, they, he did. But the curious thing also is that the the defeat of Tuthmosis, and he's the pharaoh that ended up in the Red Sea when the uh, when all the uh, pharaoh the chariots of of Egypt were destroyed in the Red Sea in the year 1447 B.C. That was the moment when Tuth, Tuthmosis the Third died, and and uh, yet and uh, and uh, of course it was at that time were the ten plagues, and at that time was this terrible thing of the of the uh, all the slaves, two couple million strong approximately, uh, leaving Egypt and so on. And in the secular record, there is not one word of all of this. Not one word that they've ever discovered. Because this was such a disgrace to Egypt. It was so bad that all of that was taken out of the Egyptian record altogether. But it did not escape the attention of the world because it's all recorded in the Bible what was going on. And if we fit the biblical record with what information we can get from the archaeological record, we can uh, really reconstruct this fairly, fairly accurately. Thank you for that very animated discourse. You know, the uh, Egyptian uh, curator or whatever of antiquities, he, he was on uh, Charlie Rose, and they said that the Discovery Channel is going to broadcast something called Secrets of Egypt. So yeah, well, they made a, the discovery. I, I read in the paper the discovery. People have spent a lot of money to talk about all this, and of course they're they're puffing it up very highly in order to get hyping it, in order to get a, as large an audience as possible. That's the way they have to make their money. Uh, and it's unfortunately, it would be wonderful if they could integrate the biblical record into the secular record, then they would have a, a much better, uh, much more uh, correct program. But if they did that, it would be giving the Bible a lot of, uh, of uh, space and the authority of the Bible and the, and the fact that the Bible is true and trustworthy. And, of course, mankind is not about to do that. We're really... A uh, natural man is no different than Tuthmosis the third when uh, 
uh, and the Egyptian pharaoh that followed him uh, when they expunged the whole secular record of the defeat of Egypt by Moses. Well, you're here, and thank God for you and Family Radio. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Camping. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. I had a curiosity listening to you talking the other night. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, at one point, the Holy Spirit was working in the churches. Now, since the church age is over, does the Bible tell us what the Holy Spirit is doing now? Oh, absolutely. The fact is that the Holy Spirit was in the churches for 1955 years. We know this because God has given us the timeline of history in the Bible. There, there's a lot of time information, and when we work through it and, and, and harmonize all of it, we find that the church age began in, in 33 A.D. when the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost, as we read about it in Acts 2, and that it was in 1988 that the church age was finished and the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the churches and Christ is there in his spirit uh, bringing, preparing the churches for judgment. However, in 1994, which was a jubilee year, on the and actually because the Bible is very, very meticulous in its language and very accurate, in its language, we uh, can uh, discover that it was on September 7th, which was, in according to the biblical calendar, the first day of the seventh month of the biblical calendar, which was a jubilee feast day. Uh, it was the first day of the seventh month, and, it, and 1994 was a jubilee year, and at that time the Holy Spirit was once more poured out, for just a very brief period of 17 years, not 1955 years again. It's just a brief period of 17 years when God is going to make a very short uh, sending forth of the gospel. At, but at, during that very short time, he's going to save an enormous number of people. Uh, typified by such language as a great multitude which no man can number. So the Holy Spirit is not working in the churches. No, they're, they're being prepared for judgment day and God is, is blinding them more and more. He sends a strong delusion upon them. They don't realize that they are worshiping Satan. They think they're worshiping Christ. But the fact is God uh, has placed Satan there to be the spiritual uh, overseer or ultimate ruler of the churches as he's preparing them for judgment but outside outside of the churches there there's a great multitude are who are beginning to learn that the bible is the word of god absolutely trustworthy it is the glorious word of god and it is what i want to try to obey and it is uh, and as I uh, am learning more and more from the Bible, I can pray for God's mercy, and maybe I too can become saved, because that is what the Holy Spirit is doing in our day. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure I understood if you gave me an answer. What is the Holy Spirit doing today? He is active, saving people all over the world, outside of any contact with the local congregation. On a person and feeling more like doing the ongoing desire of God, and is that kind of how it's working? It, it's mysterious, but God tells us that those who... The faith, faith, and that's talking about Christ, that's mm -hmm. really talking about salvation. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Now, we have to define hearing. Hearing does not mean that I'm in a room and the radio is blasting and I hear somebody reading from the Bible. That's not hearing the Word. Now, that might be true for a little baby or uh, someone without a mind, 
uh, they can be under that kind of hearing and God can apply that word to that little baby's heart and make him a child of God. But ordinarily, uh, God is, is speaking to people who are able to uh, relate to the gospel in some way, what they're hearing. And hearing is defined in the Bible as listening with a desire to be obedient. Now, that's very important that we understand this. If we are listening to the Word of God, and yet we're, we're satisfied with our present gospel, we're satisfied that we're saved, we, we really don't have to listen that carefully, we are not ready to fine-tune or make correction in anything we believe, we are not hearing the Word of God. Uh, but if we can be... It doesn't mean we have to understand everything we have to hear, but we have to listen with a desire to be obedient so that, oh, I, I know this is the law of God and I know that I must be obedient to it and I know I'm under the wrath of God, but oh God, and, and as I listen, I hear that I am commanded as a matter of fact to pray for salvation and to and to cry out to God for salvation and maybe I too can become saved and as I listen to the word of God and 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 uh, understand these things I want to try to do God's will more and more and oh Lord could it be that you will have mercy on me and maybe and none of this is going to guarantee I'm going to become saved because nobody knows whether they were elect of God and their sins had been paid for long ago. Only God knows that. So I have to wait upon God. Maybe I too could be one of this great multitude which no man can number. And that is the arena in which the Holy Spirit is working today. I see. All right. Well, thank you for clearing that for me, and uh, thank you for your ministry, and may God bless you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And, and incidentally, when we do become saved, it means that there's an enormous change in our life. We have been given a brand new resurrected soul in which we never want to sin again. And so whereas before we were saved, we were crying to God for mercy and trying to do His will, and we slipped and we fell and we failed, and yet we kept going back, Oh, Lord, help me to try to be more obedient and so on. Finally, when we truly have become saved, if that is God's good will to save us, then we will find that we're only happy when we're doing God's will. And we'll find that sin is more and more difficult to fall into because we don't like sin anymore. We hate sin. We re we uh, uh, More and more we want only to do God's will. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Campy. How are you tonight? Very well, thank you. Yeah, uh, you would agree that the, your um, like your discussions that you lead are Bible based, pretty much a hundred percent, correct? That my discussions are Bible based. Yes, yeah, like the, like all of these the the theories kind of that you you discuss. It's all like you keep coming back to the Bible, correct? Because the Bible is the only authority. Uh, Correct. It, now, now, it is but, the Word of God. It is from the mouth of God. You can't get a, a more majestic, a more accurate, a more a wonderful authority than the Bible. Now, what I'm, my question to you is, what do you think about um, these recent discoveries like at Nag Hammadi, where there are other books that were not put into the Bible, but that at some point were actually believed by um, certain groups of Christians? Well, they, I, I, I pay no attention to that because God wrote the Bible, and He did not. He did not. Excuse me. He did not write the Bible, and and then allow some men to try to put it together about what might be in the Bible. That's what the Roman Catholic Church did. They decided what they wanted to put in the Bible, so they don't have the true Bible. But the true Bible 
is uh, organ is under the authority of God. He wrote it, and and therefore he made sure that the right books were put within that Bible. And we can test it because as we go through the Bible and get better and better acquainted with it, there's a cohesiveness that is just beyond our imagination. Uh, even though it was written over a period of 1,600 years, and uh, and. Uh, 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 seemingly, uh, some books don't even relate to God very much, like the book of Esther. And yet, when we learn the rules of how we are to understand the Bible, how to seek truth from the Bible, we find that every book will stand that, that uh, uh, careful scrutiny. Whereas, if we try to do the same thing with anybody else's book, whether it's something by Hammurabi or something by uh, I don't care who it is, Thomas or whatever, we can never find that same cohesiveness. The Bible uh, stands all alone as the Word of God. But we have to pause for this message. We're continuing with the Open Forum, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Or yes, hi, Mr. Camping. Yes. Yes, good evening. Hey, I had a question for you in regards to um, kind of the, the previous call a little bit on Bible history. Yes. Um, the, um, the Do you use the King James Version Bible? Yes. Okay. Um, now, what difference is that with the Catholic Bible? I know because the Catholic Bible has like seven different chapters that the King James Version doesn't, but other than those seven chapters, what is the difference? Well, it has left out some verses. It... Uh... It, uh, uh, but the fact that they have included those, actually it's nine books, I think, uh, that they call the hidden books and made them an, uh, and indicated that they are uh, truly uh, the part of the, an integral part of the Bible means that it is their Bible. It is not the Bible that God has given. They have, they have uh, decided what the Bible is. Now, they had nothing to do with the Old Testament that was written long before uh, the Roman Catholic Church ever came into existence. So, basically, their Old Testament is the same. But the New Testament, they've taken all kinds of liberties with because they try to insist that they were the ones who organized the Bible. And that's true. They organized their Bible, but not the true Bible. And so we have to really be careful how we understand that. We, we don't look to the Roman Catholic Church for one second to find what the Bible is. We have to look at what God has provided for the last 400 years. We have the King James Bible, which is, uh, is, uh, uh, has been tested and tested and tested. It, it holds true all the way through that, that, that every book is in tr truly a part of the Bible. And, and it, it, it matches the most ancient copies that have been found of the, uh, of the original uh, uh, manuscripts. But we don't have the original, but copies that are very, very close to the original. Now, did, um, was, when Martin Luther broke away from the Catholic Church, is that when he actually adapted and changed the Bible, what he thought it should be like? No, the... the uh, the uh, the Bible existed right after it was finished, about A.D. 95, approximately. That's when the Bible was finished. Uh, it was in the days of King James that came just slightly after, let me see, yes, maybe, I don't know, maybe 50 years or approximately, almost in the same century, maybe it is the same century, of uh, Martin Luther and John Calvin and so on, that we have the English translation from the Greek of the New Testament and and which became the King James Bible and so it it there were lots of things happening right in that day as God was uh, 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 helping the churches to have a little better start again in the world because things had got, gotten very very bad insofar as the gospel was concerned okay so now wasn't the um the original well the catholic bible didn't was that canonized like in the 300 a.d around that time frame 
I, I don't I don't know how the Catholics put their Bible together. They claim that they are the uh, they uh, they are the authority that re- that has uh, been appointed by God to put the Bible together. And uh, okay, they can uh, they can make that claim. But the fact that if you pick up a Catholic Bible together today, it is a different document than the King James Bible. It has many, many books in it, and even some verses have been changed. But I thank you for calling and sharing. We don't have to... We, we have the Bible. It's the King James Bible. And I, in my own personal life, for example, for 50 years, I have been scrutinizing every book of the Bible. And, and uh, it, it, I, I'm utterly in awe, utterly in awe, as I find that whether I'm looking in the book of Esther or in Nehemiah or in Genesis or in Revelation or Matthew or Ezekiel, I don't care where I look, I find that there is complete consistency in the teachings of the Bible, even though uh, apparently there are not. And when we read, like we read the book of Esther, uh, the prayer is not mentioned, God is not mentioned. We look at that and we'd say, how in the world did that ever get in the Bible? But when we begin to follow the biblical rules that we are to look, compare spiritual things with spiritual and look for the spiritual meaning behind every, behind every incident that happened that is recorded in the book of Esther, my, my, it fits perfectly into the gospel message as every other book does. And you can't say that for the book of Judith. You can't say that for the book of Maccabees or any of the those other books uh, that are uh, that the Roman Catholics insist are, are to be looked upon as the holy canon or part of the Bible. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. I have a question that I could never understand very well when you read the Bible and or you listen to your teaching regarding, um, I understand that we have to bury our loved ones when they die, but I never got clearly, do well, we have to bury them in their bodies or that, can they be cremated? Well, that question comes up again and again. and. Uh, I, all I can tell you is what I, the, the, the two things that I, I, I know from the Bible. Number one, God uses death and cremation as a picture of hell. But the picture of cremation as hell is far more dramatic and insistent than that of death by burial. By, death by burial is also used as a picture of a loved one who is a child of God sleeping in the grave and then being resurrected on the last day. So it's completely softened over against cremation. The only passage that speaks very directly to this, and and I don't know uh, what the full meaning of this, is in Amos chapter 2, verse 1. And I'm, uh, you'll just have to make your own decision and pray for wisdom. Uh, I can tell you very frankly whether a person is cremated or, or buried or buried at sea or, or his ashes cremated and his ashes are spread all over the ocean. That person is going to be resurrected again on the last day, whether he's a believer or a non-believer. And one of the reasons... Uh, it may be subconscious, but it's uh, nevertheless one reason that is uh, heavy in this whole area. Uh, there is an economic reason, but there's also the idea that if I am cremated and my ashes are spread out over the land or over the ocean, there's no way that I could ever become resurrected. We must remember that every human being knows there is a judgment day because God's law is written on their heart. And, and they would, would like to die hoping, hoping, hoping that there could never be a resurrection, then they would never have to stand for judgment. In other words, I've lived out my life, and like an animal, I'm dead, 
and that's my, the end. I'm annihilated. But it won't be true. They will be resurrected. The Bible is crystal clear. But insofar as the direct statement on cremation, God says in uh, Amos chapter 2, verse 1, For three transgressions of Moab, and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because he burned the bones of the king of Edom into lime. And that's cremation. Now, uh, I don't, uh, I could, I could develop this a little bit. I do know that man was created in the image of God, even the unsaved, uh, non-elect people, and we are to always look with respect at a person. It's interesting, you know, uh, that have you ever thought about this, that when, uh, when uh, people uh, do violence to the dead body, of someone who has died, uh, they uh, they uh, carve up the body or they uh, uh, do ugly things to that body. We are appalled by that. Well, that body is dead. It's dead. It's just a corpse. What's so, what's so big about that or what's so terrible about that? That's because even in mankind, there's a sense that mankind is more than just an animal, that mankind is a... Is, uh, is something special. And even that dead body is, is to be treated with some respect. And maybe this is what God has in mind here, because he, the king of Moab, burned the bones of the king of Edom into lime. Now, incidentally, the king of Edom in the picture in the Bible is a picture of those who are in rebellion against God. Those who never want to turn, be, become saved or never do become saved. And so it is uh, doing something to the body of, uh, of somebody who, uh, who uh, obviously was uh, uh, not an elect of God and who will be resurrected to stand for judgment on the last day. And yet God here is saying, uh, uh, this, giving this kind of language and we, like I say, intuitively we respect the bodies of those who have died and therefore, ideally the, the best thing to do although, again, like I say, it won't affect the resurrection at all but ideally, uh, the best thing to do is tenderly bury that body uh, it's the last last good thing we can do for that person it won't change that person's resurrection at all that person can't feel it at all but it's just out of respect that he was a fellow human created in the image of God as all of us are but thank you and I know it costs money uh, and uh, and if uh, loved ones that are left behind better dig into their pockets if possible if possible in order to come up with the funds to uh, do this. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, Brother Camping, I was cut off. Um, well, I got my answer from God about Jesus being God. And I found out it was in um, chapter John chapter 14, verse 20. John 14, verse 20. Just that verse, and then I'll sum it up. Yeah, let's look at that a moment. John 14, verse 20. We read, At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Uh, uh, you now, what is your question about this? Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm going to get the answers that God placed my heart on, because I didn't have the answer myself. So Jesus is God. What it is is that I had to look up Trinity to find out what Trinity means. So unity means, uh, Trinity means the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes. Okay, then I had to go in and look up the word in when it says in my Father. So I was saying to myself, well, if that's like that, that means he is God because he's there. So, but it's just well, we that can't it's, a, tell. it's a spirit. And then it says here that when he means son, is that he had to come down to make man in a human form. Okay, now son means a male child of offspring. Okay, now Jesus was male child. So son would mean human being. So when we look at son, 
in the unity of the Trinity. That means God just took that word that is that is his spirit, but is called the Son. So he sent down his spirit and he named it Son, because that's part of him. So yeah. that's where we get the, you know, confusion of saying Son. It's really his spirit, but it's called Son. Well, now, excuse me. If we go through the whole Bible and lay out all the verses, and you have to do that if you're going to try to uh, decide that I know something about God. Uh, you better lay out all the verses. Now here, for example, it's saying, I am in my Father, but it also says that I am in you, and ye are in me. And if God is God and we are in Him, then does that make us God? And, and uh, like God the Father. Uh, and so we have to be very careful. But when we go through all the verses, there are many, many verses that insist that uh, Christ is God. Like in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, where God says of the Lord Jesus, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. And as we've talked about it before, uh, there are uh, verses that speak about Christ as the creator of the world. And Genesis 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. There are plenty of verses that will show us that the Lord Jesus Christ is eternal God. Now, when we look at the, when we uh, work through the Bible to understand what it means to be the Son of God, we have to be careful. Because Christ is from everlasting past. You mean he was actually born to the Father somehow? No way. Uh, he is called the Son of God because he rose from the grave. He, uh, he uh, 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 had taken on a human nature and, and as God himself, he, ha uh, he is... Uh, in fact, he's called my uh, uh, in John three sixteen. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. To beget means to be, uh, uh, to uh, come into being. Now, how could that be if Christ is from everlasting past? And when we study that through the Bible, it means that he is begotten because he. Uh, endured the second death, eternal damnation, which is called the second death. And he came out at the other end, uh, as demonstrated by the resurrection on Sunday morning back there in 33 A.D. after he was crucified. And, uh, and thus, in that sense, he is begotten of God. But the fact that, uh, uh, the fact is he is from everlasting past. And, and, if, and as we go on and on trying to analyze all the statements of the Bible concerning God, a lot of them we cannot harmonize because our finite minds, our human minds, while they were created way, way superior to an animal's mind, nevertheless, uh, and because our, our, our minds are superior to an animal's minds, we can understand uh, words like mercy and patience and kindness and and uh, ju justice and and so on and so on, uh, but but we cannot understand God because God is way way more infinite than our minds will permit. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. The number to call, incidentally, is 1-800-322-5385. 1-800-322-5385. And shall we take our next call, please? Hello? Hello? Good evening. Pretty good. Go ahead with your call, please. John 21, verse 7. I'm sorry? John 21, verse 7. Psalm 21? Verse 7. Psalm 21, verse 7. Let's look at that. Psalm 21, 
Verse 7, For the king trusteth in Jehovah, and through the mercy of the Most High he shall not be moved. Is that it? Oh, John 21. Uh, yeah, uh, John 21. John 21, verse 7. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, uh, saith unto Peter, is it, it is the Lord. Now, uh, we, let's, let's get the context. Uh, the disciples, uh, have experienced the, the witnessing of the death of Christ on the cross, the terrible, terrible things that happened there. They knew, they knew about the empty tomb. They had seen the risen Christ. And Christ had told them, now wait for me, and in time the Holy Spirit will be poured out, and uh, and then you will begin your task of being a witness. And so in the meanwhile, they're fishing, and they caught nothing. And uh, so uh, Jesus stood out on the bank and saw them in their boat fishing a short way from land, and said, and, they, and the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered, No. Then he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fish. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, and that disciple we know to be John from uh, uh, certain evidence in the Bible, that, that uh, said unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his uh, fisher's coat about him, that is, he, uh, he had been stripped down to fish, and now he put his coat on, and... Uh, and he did cast himself into the sea. And now what is your question? What is the meaning when he cast himself in the sea? Uh, the spiritual meaning that he cast himself in the, into the sea? Oh, my. Um, I'm sorry, I, I can't help you right now. At one time I worked through that verse very carefully, and it does have a spiritual meaning, of course. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I, I'm, I'd be speculating if I tried to help you. I'm sorry. But it means, of course, that he, uh, in the historical setting, he, he cast himself in the sea in order to come to the Lord Jesus. And because... Uh, they began to drag that that net in into the shore. They uh, they could not put it into their little ship, so they were dragging it into shore. And Peter was uh, right there, uh, uh, heading up that activity to bring those fish in. But uh, uh, to be cast into the sea is really a, a figure of being in hell, and it's from there that God saves us as He takes us out of hell, out from under the wrath of God. But how that figures right here in this passage, I better not try because I will be speculating. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes, I had a question about John uh, chapter 21, verse 22. John 21, verse 22. Yes. Where Jesus said unto uh, Peter, if I will that he, or to, uh, uh, yes, to uh, Peter said, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Is that the verse? Yes. I was wondering, is one of the disciples still alive today? Because it says that it started rumors amongst the other brothers that that disciple would not die until Jesus returned. I took that as maybe the disciple is still alive today. Is that true, or? Um, I, I'm sorry. I, I I can't help you. I'm sorry. It's been too long since I looked at this. I'd rather not speculate. All right. Well, I shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Hello. Wow! I can't believe I got through. 
I'm driving a truck, so be bear with me, please, sir. Um, first of all, I'd like to say I have a great deal of respect for you. Um, but my question for you is um, the people that uh, that uh, are cast into hell, uh, are they going to have a memory of the present day? The Bible does not tell us I'm so at all. I'm sorry? The Bible does not give us any detail. We know that the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. We know that they have no hope. We know that they are consigned to hell forevermore, uh, and they're cast away from the presence of God. Uh, we know that it's a place of great anguish and, and sorrow, but insofar as what they're thinking about, we don't know. We, the Bible doesn't go into that detail. Okay. Um, other than that, um, I think you're doing uh, really wonderful work, and um, um, I really I think it's great. Thank you very kindly. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Brother Camping, good evening, sir. Okay. Um, How are you? Very well, thank you. Brother Camping, um, just young, I'm just 42, just wondering, to get started reading on this Bible issue, very difficult to understand. You said the, if you could just really quick, uh, the book Young's the Concordian. Young's Concordance. Uh, is, is, that'll teach me a little bit of um, what everything means, sort of say, in the book? Well, the, 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 let me t tell you what the purpose of the Concordance is, and we don't go on want to go outside of that purpose, because otherwise we're going to be misled. The purpose of the concordance, whether it's Young's or Strong's or any other concordance, is to show us where every uh, word in the original language uh, can be located in the Bible. Let me say it this way. Let's take a, a Greek word or a Hebrew word, either one can be, and we will find that sometimes it's only been used a few times, and it's always translated the same way in our English Bible. But more commonly, we will find that same Hebrew word or English word, uh, uh, or Greek word, rather. The Greek is the New Testament. The Hebrew is the Old Testament. And let's say it's a Hebrew word in the Old Testament. And as we uh, uh, look up that word, we'll find that it has been translated in five different ways in our English Bible and we are not warned by the English at all that it's always that same word and so we we look at a word in a verse and we'd like to find every other verse in the Bible where that same Hebrew word can be found and that's where the concordance can help us because it will show us what that Hebrew word is and it will also also show us every other place in the Bible where that Hebrew word is found and the same is true of a Greek word so that we can locate all of these places where that particular word is found, see how it's used in each and every one of these places, and thus arrive at a definition of what that verse is talking about as we see how it's used in all the different places. And uh, this is very helpful in coming to an understanding of the Bible. But right now, I have to say good night until our next open forum. May the Lord richly bless you. Good night.